Okay, so in this video, I'm just going to go through the differentiation test we gave you and make sure you have your test open and just compare what I'm the solutions here to what you did yourself. For the first part of this question, we're given 10 marks for your first principles. You're asked to differentiate from first principles f of x is 6 minus 4x minus 3x squared. It's standard enough, it's basically the same as the examples we did in class. Once you have f of x, then you have to get, get f of x plus h. So wherever there's an x, you sub in an x plus h. And when you multiply it out, you should end up with 6 minus 4x minus 4h minus 3x squared minus 6hx minus 3h squared. Then you need to subtract f of x, which means you take your first line and you just change all the signs. You get minus 6 plus 4x plus 3x squared. The reason I'm writing it there is because the six, the plus 6 and the minus 6 will cancel, these terms will cancel, and these terms will cancel. So now I just have f of x plus h minus f of x, and I'm left with minus 4h minus 6hx minus 3h squared. Your next step is to get f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, and you should have minus 4 minus 6x minus 3h. And the last thing is the limit as h approaches 0 of what you had on the left hand side. H is approaching zero, which means in our heads we think of it as H is equal to zero, but you cannot put that down on paper. You cannot actually sub in H equals zero. If H was zero here, that term would just be gone, so you just have to put minus four minus six X. I can tell from my original question that the derivative of minus four X is minus four, the derivative of minus three X squared is minus six X. So that's what you needed to get the full marks in part A. Okay, for B part one, again, there's 10 marks for this. You're given the function f of x is 1 over x plus 2, and you're asked to prove that this function has no turning points. If I asked you to prove that a to find the turning points of a function, you would get the first derivative and let it equal to 0. Because to identify the turning points, you're trying to work out when is the slope equal to 0. So if this function has no turning points, that means that the slope will never be equal to 0, or in other words, it means that the first derivative can never be equal to 0. So to prove a function is no turning points, I need to find the first derivative, and once I have it, I need to state why the first derivative could never be equal to zero. Okay, there's a couple of different ways of getting the derivative of this function. What most of you went for was the quotient rule, and it is possible to do it by the quotient rule, but it's far harder. A much easier way to do it is the way I've done it here, where you just eliminate your fraction. If you have f of x equals one over x to the power two, you use the rules of powers on page 21 in your maths tables, and you realize that x plus 2 to the power 1 on the bottom of a fraction, if you bring it up, it becomes x plus 2 to the power minus 1. And now I can just use the chain rule in order to differentiate. So to get f dash x, you bring the minus 1 in front, and you rewrite your bracket, but you decrease the power of the bracket by 1. Minus 1, and you go down 1 to minus 2. And then you have to multiply by the derivative of what's in the bracket. The derivative of x plus 2 is just 1. The derivative of x is just 1. Now, I just need to prove that this could never be equal to 0. In order to prove that this is never equal to 0, it's easier if we write it as a fraction again. So you use that rule of powers again, and instead of writing this as x plus 2 to the power of minus 2, you bring the bracket underneath, and it becomes x plus 2 to the power of plus 2. So your derivative simplified fully is minus 1 over x plus 2 squared. Now, you don't have to go any further with that. We can just say here that the first derivative could never be equal to zero. Let's just write out a few fractions that can be equal to zero. Like zero over five, that's zero. Or zero over 10, that's, that, that has a value of zero. Zero over minus eight, that has a value of zero. That's not an eight. So any fraction with a zero on the top is equal to zero. That's the only way that a fraction could be equal to zero. So in, for example, in this one, Obviously, this, the top of this fraction could never be equal to zero. And that's why the derivative here could never be equal to zero. It's because the numerator is a non-zero constant. In other words, on the top of the fraction, you have a constant that's not zero. If you have a non-zero constant on the top, like minus one, then obviously you could never have this situation, so the first derivative could never be equal to zero. Therefore, we can say that f of x has no turning points. And that got you 10 marks in this question. Okay, in B part 2, we're told that a student states that the function in B part 1 is always decreasing. We need to agree or disagree with them and explain our answer. So the function, we've worked out that f dash x of the function is minus 1 over x plus 2 to be squared. And in other words, we've worked out the slope is minus 1 over x plus 2 to be squared. 
if a function is always decreasing, that means that the slope is negative. It means the slope will always be negative. So in this scenario, you should agree with the student and say yes, as the first derivative is less than zero. The first derivative will always be less than zero. But you have to prove, you have to state why it, you have to explain this. In order to explain this, you have to say the numerator is a negative constant. Clearly the top of this fraction is a minus one. And a lot of students said that, but then just stopped. But that's not enough. That doesn't necessarily mean that the fraction is negative. Because just because the top is negative, doesn't mean the whole thing is negative. For example, if you had minus one divided by minus five, that's plus one fifth. So it wasn't enough here to just state that the top was negative. You also had to state that the denominator is greater than zero. The reason you know that x plus two to be squared is greater than zero is because any real number squared is greater than zero. Remember, we did stuff like this in algebra at the start of the year with our abstract inequalities. So you had to prove here that the top of the fraction was negative, the bottom of the fraction was positive. And a negative divided by a positive will always give you a negative value. Or in other words, that proves that f dash x is always less than zero, and that the, which means the slope is always negative. The slope is always negative, the function is always decreasing. So this is what you needed for your last five marks in this question. Okay, the first part of the second question, you're asked to get the derivative of x squared by sine three x plus five. For the most part, people did quite well on this. There was five marks for this and 10 marks for the next two bits. In this scenario, you've got one variable, x squared, multiplied by another variable, sine three x plus five. In any scenario in differentiation, if you're differentiating one variable multiplied by another variable, you're gonna use the product rule. So to do this, my u will be x squared and my v will be sine three x plus five. What some students did was they grouped the x squared with the sine. You never ever split sine with its angle. Sine cos or tan, whatever comes after it is an angle. So sine of 3x plus 5, this is the angle. So your v has to be sine 3x plus 5. The, the, the sine is one variable, and the trig is one variable, and the algebra is another variable. So u here will be x squared, so the derivative du dx will be 2x to the power of 1. And v here is sine 3x plus 5, and according to page 25 in my maths tables, the sine of an angle becomes the cos of that angle. So sine 3x plus 5 becomes cos 3x plus 5 but then you have to multiply by the derivative of the 3x plus five. The derivative of 3x plus five is three. Remember, we did questions like this by substitution in class last week. You can do substitution for those, but it's easier to just do it in your head. So now I have u du dx v and dv dx, and the maths tables tells me that the derivative I'm looking for dy dx will be u multiplied by dv dx plus v multiplied by du dx. If I just sub in u by d v dx plus v by d u dx, you can't really simplify it much. All I did here was multiply the three by x squared and got three x squared cos three x plus five. And here you should put the two x before the sine three x plus five. That's your final answer. You can't really make it any neater. There's five marks going for that bit. Okay, the second part of this question, there was 10 marks. You were asked to differentiate y equals cos inverse two over x squared. Notice here that I've put in the y. It makes your life so much easier if you have the y. They just wrote cos inverse two over x squared, but it's easier if you write it like y equals, because that's the way we always differentiate things. Now, there are two ways of doing this question. There is a formula in the maths tables where it's possible to do it like that, and I'm gonna do it both ways in this video. But the way I do it first is the way that we taught you in the intensive, and this is the way that I'd advise you to try it. In general, it's more reliable to do it this way. And if you just get the hang of this, it's a much better tactic going into your leave insert to be able to do it the first method rather than the second method. But I'm gonna show you both of them anyway. So the first thing you wanna do here is you want to eliminate your inverse trig. So you bring your cos to the other side. And you could write this as cos y is equal to two divided by x squared. Now the goal now is to differentiate both sides, but I don't like the fraction on the right hand side, so I wanna rewrite the right hand side first. Rather than writing this as two over x squared, it's easier to write it as two x squared to the power of minus two. And now I'm ready to differentiate both sides. So to differentiate the left-hand side, according to the maths tables, the derivative of cos y is minus sine y. But remember from when we went through implicit differentiation, whenever you differentiate a y, you have to multiply by dy dx. So the derivative of cos y is minus sine y by dy dx. And the right hand side is straightforward enough. You bring the minus two in front, 
minus 2 by 4 is minus 4, and you decrease the power of x by 1, so it becomes minus 3. Now, the goal in differentiation is always to get dy dx. So what I want to do now is I want to isolate dy dx. So let's just, first of all, let's just isolate, let's just simplify the right-hand side. Rather than an x to the power of minus 3, I could write that as minus 4 divided by x to the power of 3. But what, what happens to this sine y? So all I've done there is I've simplified the right-hand side. But I want to isolate dy dx. And in order to isolate dy dx from this line, I need to divide both sides by minus sine y. If I divided both sides by minus sine y, I'd end up, there's a minus sine y on the top and the left, so then there's a minus sine y on the bottom on the right. So all I did there was divide both sides by minus sine y. Now usually this would be your final answer. However, I'm not allowed to have my dy dx in terms of y. I need it in terms of x. So I have to do something about this sine y. So once you get to this stage, you need to go back to the second line. The second line, what's written here, is going to allow me to figure out what the sine of y is. This bit is purely just trigonometry. From trigonometry, if I take the second line, I could draw a right angle triangle. This line tells me that the cos of y is 2 over x squared. I know that if y existed in a right angle triangle, then the cos would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So I could say here that in the, if y was in a right angle triangle, the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse would be 2 over x squared. Now, I want to find the sine of y. If I'm trying to find the sine of y, then obviously my goal here is to get the opposite in terms of x. In order to get the opposite in terms of x, we just use Pythagoras. While we're doing this, I'm just going to call this side the opposite, or O for opposite. If I sub into Pythagoras, I would get O squared plus 2 squared is equal to x squared squared. And if I simplify that, I get O squared plus 4 equals x to the power of 4. Now I said that my goal here is to try and get the opposite in terms of x. So obviously I want to isolate O and get it in terms of x. Here I could say that O squared is equal to x to the power of 4 minus 4. And in order to get O on its own, I would get the square root of both sides. O would become the square root of x to the power of 4 minus 4. So now I can say that the opposite in this right angle triangle would be the square root of x to the power of 4 minus 4. And the reason I wanted to do that was in order to find the sine of y. The sine of y is the opposite over the hypotenuse. In this scenario, the opposite is the square root of x to the power of 4 minus 4. The hypotenuse is x squared. So what I've done on the right hand side is purely trigonometry but it's allowed me to get the sine of y in terms of x. And I'm happy out with that because if I get the sine of y in terms of x, it will allow me to get dy dx in terms of x. So now I just sub into what my dy dx was. dy dx, notice that on the top there's a minus and on the bottom there's a minus. So the minuses will just cancel each other out. Minus divided by minus gives me plus. And here I have four divided by, and instead of sine y, I'm gonna plug in all of this. It just becomes 4 divided by x to the power of 4 minus 4 over x squared times, there's also an x cubed in the denominator. Now I can simplify this denominator because if you look on the bottom of the denominator, on the bottom line of the denominator there's an x squared and on the top line of the denominator there's an x cubed. So 2 of the x squareds on the bottom will cancel with 2 of the x squareds on the top. And my final answer here is going to work out as 4 divided by the square root of x to the power of 4 minus 4 times x squared into x cubed leaves me with x. So my final answer there, dy dx, is 4 over the square root of x to the power of 4 minus 4 times x. Now, obviously, admittedly, that is quite tricky, and a lot of you are still struggling with it. I advise you to just practice a few of those. Just make up a couple and try and work through them, and show me in class or show during class during the week, and we'll talk you through it you're better off, it's more reliable to do it like that. Because if you do it like that, they're all the exact same. But make sure, look at that one, and if you're struggling with it, make sure you talk to me in class about it. I'm gonna now look at how you would do it by using the formula. Okay, the alternative to that is to use the rule in the maths tables on page 25. Just again, I'd advise you not to do this because I think this is harder, and it's different every time, so it makes it a good bit trickier. 
The rule in the maths table says that if you have cos inverse of x over a constant, then the derivative is minus 1 over the, over the square root of the constant squared minus x squared. The problem in this question is that we have a constant over x rather than x over a constant. So you're not allowed to differentiate it immediately. What you have to do first is eliminate the fraction. If this is an x to the power 2 on the bottom, you bring the power up and you change the sign of the power. You'd have to view this as 2x to the power of minus 2 divided by 1. And now I could say that I have x over a constant. So now I have it similar to what's in the maths tables, I can apply the rule. If I apply this rule of differentiation, I could say that dy dx, the derivative, it's minus 1 on the top of the fraction over the square root, and a is the constant on the bottom of the fraction, so in this case 1 to be squared, and x is whatever's on the top, so in this case it's 2x to the power of minus 2 to be squared. So it's going to be the top of the fraction, 2x to the power of minus 2 to be squared. However, remember that any time you use one of those rules, like if you use the trig rule, it, the sine of an angle becomes the cost of the angle, but then you multiply by the derivative of the angle. In this case, if I use this rule, I have to follow the rule exactly, but then multiply by the derivative of 2x to the power of minus 2. If I was trying to differentiate 2x to the power of minus 2, I would bring the power in front, and it becomes minus 4x to the power of minus 3. So I'll follow the rule in the maths tables, and according to this, cos inverse of x over a will become this. So cos inverse of 2x to the power of minus 2 over this will become this fraction. But then I multiply by the derivative of the algebra. The derivative of 2x to the power of minus 2 is minus 4x to the power of minus 3. But now we have to simplify this one fully. So to work through this, we could start off, well, minus 1 by minus 4 will give me plus 4. So there's a 4 on the top. Rather than writing the x to the power of minus 3 on the top of the fraction, you could put x to the power of plus 3 on the bottom. And now we need to simplify what's in the square root. In the square root, 1 squared is just 1, and 2x to the power of minus 2 to be squared, well, 2 by 2 gives me 4, and when you multiply x to the power of minus 2, and you get it to the power of 2, you, you, just, you multiply your powers by each other, minus 2 by 2 gives me 4. So this becomes x to the power of minus 4. So now I have 4 over x cubed times 1 plus 4x to the power of minus 4. But I need to simplify this because I can't leave it to the power of a negative to the power of minus 4. So if I continue this on, I could write this, I leave most of it the same. The only thing I'm changing is the x to the power 4 times x to the power of minus 4. I bring that underneath and it becomes 4 over x to the power of 4. Now in my square root, I have two fractions and I'm adding them together. So what I need to do now to simplify this is to get a common denominator. So we were on the, where we were on the last line is here. 4 over x cubed times root 1 over 1 plus 4 over x to the power of 4. What I've gotten in my third is I've gotten a common denominator. The common denominator for these two fractions is x to the power of 4. The bottom of the first fraction has a 1. And 1 divides into the common denominator x to the power of 4 times. So it's x to the power of 4 times what's on the top of the fraction, which is a 1. So I just get x to the power of 4 on the top. Then I ask myself, how many times does x to the power of 4 divide into the common denominator? It divides in once. So it's 1 times what's on the top of that fraction. 1 times 4 just gives me 4. So now I have root x to the power of 4 plus 4 over x to the power of 4. Which I can, rather than writing this, the whole fraction over one square, under one square root, I can split it up into root x to the power of 4 plus 4 divided by the square root of x to the power of 4. And that's useful because the square root of x to the power of 4 is x squared. And now you'll notice that at this line, this is the same as we had in the, in the method I showed you first, where when we subbed in the sine of y, we ended up here. And in this scenario, the x squared on the bottom will divide into two of the x squareds on the top, and you're left with your final answer of 4 over x times root x to the power of 4 plus 4. Now, the only reason I'm showing you that is to make a point here to not do it like that. You, the method we're going by, and the method I showed you, the first method I showed you in this video is the way to go with these questions, because the problem is, if you follow this method, it's different every single time. 
If you follow our method, it's the same general template every single time. So let's move on now and look at the last part of the question. The final part of this test was 10 marks for it. You were told that y is equal to x to the power of 4 times e to the 3x. And you were asked to show that dy dx minus, minus 3 times y equals 4y over x. So in this case, ultimately this is the question. Ultimately we have to prove that that's true. I know what y is from the question, so if I can, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to sub into this equation. Instead of y, I'm going to sub in x to the power of 4, e to the 3x. I can sub it in there, and I can sub it in there. And I'm going to find dy dx, and once I've found dy dx, I'm going to sub it in here. So I've, I have y up here, I get the derivative of that, I'll know what dy dx is. And then all it is is substitution. Instead of dy dx, you're going to sub in your derivative. Instead of y, you're going to sub in this. And hopefully when I do that, everything's going to cancel. So the first thing we need to look at is getting the derivative of x to the power of 4, e to the 3x. You should recognize, and most of you did, that this is a product rule. One variable multiplied by another. So I need to use the product rule in order to differentiate y here. So it's relatively straightforward here. u is x to the power of 4, which means the u dx is 4x cubed. v is e to the 3x. So dv dx, e to the 3x just stays the exact same, but then you multiply by the derivative of the power. The derivative of 3x is just 3. Now, since I'm using product rule, dy dx will be u by dv dx plus v by du dx, which is x to the power of 4 by 3e to the 3x plus 3e to the 3x by 4x cubed. Now, this is just really messy the way it is here, so you have to try and... It's much easier here if we put a bit of structure to it. So the structure I've chosen is to put the number, and then the x, and then the e. So the first term I can write it as 3x to the power of 4, e to the 3x. The next one I can write it as 4x to the power of 3, e to the 3x. So now I have dy dx, and I have y. Which means I can now just sub into the original equation given, and hopefully everything on the left will be equal to everything on the right. So I know y is this, and I know dy dx is this. The question asked me to show that dy dx minus 3 times y equals 4y over x. So all I've done here is I subbed in my dy dx, I've subbed in my y, and I've subbed in my y. Now, a lot of students' problem here was that there was no structure to your terms. I've put a structure to all of my terms, and then each one of them starts with the number, and then the x, and then the e. So it's easier to recognize like terms here. If you look at the first term I have on the left and the last term I have on the left, one of them is plus 3 x to the 4 e to the 3 x. One of them is minus 3 x to the 4 e to the 3 x. It's just plus one thing minus, it's plus 3 minus 3. So those two terms cancel each other out. So on the left hand side now I just have the term 4 x cubed e to the 3 x. And the problem at the moment on the right is that this is an x to the power of 4. But I have an x on the bottom as well. So I can actually divide this x into the four x's on the top. x into x to the power of four leaves me with x to the power of three. So I actually just get the same thing on the right hand side as I have on the left. So I'm happy enough I can say that that one is true. Clearly what they asked me to show is correct. Now there's 10 marks going for that one as well. Um, hopefully all of that makes sense. If you're unsure on any of it, the handiest thing to do is actually just leave a comment under the video here and I'll get back to you.